now and look deeper at the mantle. The last class, we looked really into the structure of the mantle. That was the main idea, where there are these different zones, the rigid lithosphere, the plastic asthenosphere, the transition zone, and then the lower mantle. And density inferred from seismic velocities are the way we understand about these transitions. And each one is associated with a transition of a mineral going to a more dense phase, like olivine to woodsleyite, woodsleyite to ringwoodite, ringwoodite to bridgmanite and periclase. Now today what I want to do is I want to talk to you about a new topic, which is sampling of the Earth's mantle. So here we're going to go into Roman numeral 4, and we're going to title it Sampling the Mantle. There's certain times that we can actually get our hands directly on the mantle to try to understand more about it. Now one thing that we know about the mantle is that the upper mantle, at least, is peridotite. I'm pretty sure you are very familiar with peridotite. I'll insert a picture here. Here is peridotite hosted within a basalt matrix. This basalt represents a melt from the Earth's mantle that rose fast enough that it actually ripped off chunks of the mantle wall rock and brought it to us. And we see this rock that is composed of green minerals in particular, which are going to be a lot of olivine, CPX, OPX, and there ends up being an additional phase that often occurs in peridotite. Now the name peridotite, this is a catch-all. Remember the IUGS classification diagrams? There's all these different triangles where you can come up with rock names. Well, peridotite is technically not on there. Well, instead, there's names like Lurzolite and Hargisbergite and Websterite. Those are all the more technical names for peridotite. But peridotite's a safe catch-all that we'll use anytime we're talking about rock from the upper mantle. Well, if we looked at the mineral formulas of olivine, clinopyroxene, and orthopyroxene, we would get elements like magnesium, silicon, iron. What else would we get? calcium, oxygen. And if we come when we look at that list, what it these are most of the most common minerals in earth or sorry, elements in the earth, except for one that we're missing. And that one that we're missing is aluminum. And so this is ends up being the additional phase that occurs in the mantle and it is called an aluminum bearing phase. And there's a couple different options of what it can be. So what we're going to do here is we're going to put number one. Let's talk about this aluminum bearing phase. In short, it has a strong depth control. There is a depth control to which phase holds the aluminum in the upper mantle. And we can just do this schematically, I think, faster than any other way. Here is the surface of the Earth, and in the shallow lithospheric mantle, the aluminum bearing phase is plagioclase. As if we go deeper than about 30 kilometers, then that phase must be spinel. And if we go deeper than about 80 kilometers, then the aluminum bearing phase is garnet. And so if you collect a sample of peridotite from some mantle xenolith and it has spinel in it, then you know that your magma gener was generated between 30 and 80 kilometers depth. If it has garnet, then it's a deep sample from deeper than 80 kilometers. So the different ways that we get our hands on the mantle now are going to be our next big headings. One's called xenoliths, the other is ophiolite, and the final is abyssal peridotite. So let's start with xenoliths first. Right? We've talked about xenoliths earlier in the semester. These are our foreign bodies. In this case, they're foreign from the mantle. And so we're going to put that here as our first definition, is that these are inclusions, right? so solid pieces, inclusions, in melts derived from the mantle. I mean, that alone is actually pretty cool. These basalts and maybe kimberlites are generated by processes in the mantle and are able to rise up fast enough to bring these chunks to us. Kimberlites. 
These are examples of melts that are made from the mantle. And the other thing about xenoliths is that they are not rare. In fact, there are thousands of different localities across Earth where you can find xenoliths. And they thus provide our best window. Let's say that. Provide our best window to understanding mantle petrology and process. Into mantle petrology and process. Now the downside of course with these things is that they are small. They end up being like fist sized. So one small negative, negative, so even though there's a lot of them, is that they tend to be small. They're like fist sized or smaller. Sometimes they're tiny, they're just grains. Smaller. Other times, maybe they're as big as a car. Well, I don't know if I've ever seen one that big. But they certainly can't tell you much about the structure. It's mostly just about mineralogy and composition. The number one thing we learn is that we get a lot of different flavors of peridotite. That's the most common type of xenolith that is brought to the Earth's surface. Uh, rarer things include uh, diamonds. Diamonds are coming from 100 to 600 kilometers down. So actually into the asthenosphere at times, where most of the peridotites are coming from the lithosphere. Rarely we will get asthenosphere um, peridotites. Now another way that we can understand what's going, down, going on down in the mantle is by looking at ophiolite sequences. Ophiolites. I'll read you the definition here for an ophiolite and then write it down. It's a part of the lithosphere that's tectonically emplaced in a mountain belt. So it's a part of the lithosphere. So it's the lithospheric mantle that is tectonically emplaced in a mountain belt. What kind of plate tectonic boundary does this mean? This means it has to be forming at a convergent boundary. I want you to think about, you take a like, thick portion of the mantle that ramps up to the Earth's surface in response to some kind of smashing collision, okay? It's a cordoning up. The most common types of rocks that are provided within ophiolites is, so, is oceanic lithosphere. So it's commonly oceanic lithosphere into some kind of arc setting into an arc setting the really neat thing about ophiolites is that they're huge they're not like fist sized chunks they can be many kilometers in size so these are extensive windows they're rare there's maybe 20 of them on earth but they provide this extensive window into mantle and you can see really interesting things like it's like structural studies so let's just put comma allows structural studies the most famous one on earth is called the Oman Ophiolite and if you wanted to look that up on Wikipedia you will see some pretty sweet pictures but as a sketch here for the notes, let's make it this mountain range. Here's our mountain range. And what we end up getting is there'll be some like fault usually that juxtaposes our ophiolite sequence, ophiolite, from other metamorphic rocks, let's say. Okay, here's our big fault. But then what we see here is a full crustal sequence where near the surface we'll get, uh, let's say, pelagic sediments, and then that we should see this thick sequence of pillow basalts. So these circles are, okay? So we're gonna get pelagic sediments and pillows, basically the ocean floor. That's what we have at the top of ophiolites. And then there's usually a sheeted dike complex, and then some kind of cumulate layer gabbros. All right, so we got sheeted dikes. We've got layered gabbros. 
that's still the crust. Then there's going to be exposed for us to actually go walk and touch would be the actual moho. And then below the moho, we would get peridotitic lithospheric mantle. We can label that here as peridotite. Peridotite. That's what an ophiolite is. Now, the last place that we can get our hands on the Earth's mantle is at abyssal peridotite. Since the last part of today's notes, abyssal, it's a Y S S peridotites. The name abyssal here is the key to the whole thing, and these are occurring on the ocean floor. Our definition for an abyssal peridotite, I'll read it to you. It's lithospheric mantle exposed at slow spreading centers. Lithospheric mantle exposed at slow spreading centers. That means what kind of plate tectonic boundary? These are extensional boundaries, all right, divergent boundaries, where we have a mid-ocean ridge system, right, where two plates are pulling apart. We know what's supposed to happen there. But what if they're pulling apart faster than mantle upwelling is occurring at? Ooh, that's maybe not the right, exactly the right word choice. But there is very low, let's say this way, there is some melt that gets generated, but there's very little melt that gets generated. And so most of this area here doesn't get covered by, like that's been spread, it doesn't get covered by lava flows, buried, right? Instead what we have is we just have mantle on the seafloor. Mantle is exposed on the seafloor. A couple things that the way to get our hands on it then would be that we dredge, we take a boat, we go to the middle of the ocean where they have these spreading centers that don't produce much lava, and we dredge ocean floor from boats. In fact, let's say here, let's say mantle's on the seafloor because not buried by mid-ocean ridge basalt lavas. There's a handful of these on Earth. Another thing that we've learned from abyssal peridotites is that the rocks that are exposed there are infertile. This is infertile mantle that is exposed, that has already been melted previously. And with that, let's finish off this lecture and pick up next time thinking about chemistry with fertile and infertile parts of the mantle.